So today we're going to continue with Phaedrus and its rich and exciting study of language. In particular, we're going to look at the way that the same structures of language are both the powers that allow us to deceive and the very powers that allow us to illuminate the truth. Uh, and so we'll begin by continuing a theme from last time, uh, which is the theme of deception. So last time we talked a little bit about the theme of deception. Uh, Socrates there had talked about how it's in the very nature of reality that things can be compared to each other, that uh, things are in different ways similar to and dissimilar from each other. And he talked about the way that we use language to bring those things out. In particular, he focused on the theme of uh, homonymy or equivocation, which is using the same word to mean two different things. Uh, he gave the example of using the word horse uh, and relying on it to mean both donkey and horse, or using the word good and uh, using it both to refer to good things and bad things. Um, we're going to come back to look at that theme of equivocation uh, more substantially uh, in a few minutes. But first I want to continue the theme he was raising there, which is that we can use that homonymy for deception. Uh, and indeed that's the, the, the way he enters into this topic at 261e. He'd said, uh, it seems that there's one single art that governs all speaking, by means of it, one can make out as similar anything that can be so assimilated to everything to which it can be made similar. Uh, and uh, in the Nehemiah's translation, and expose anyone who tries to hide the fact that that is what he's doing. Actually, it's, uh, and if, if someone else is uh, doing that, making similar, and, uh, and the Greek is either, and, and hiding that or, and being hidden from that, uh, you can lead him to the light. Um, and I might come back to talk about that language a bit. Anyway, right after that, Fever says, what are you talking about? And Socrates says, I think it will be clear if we look at it in this way. And then he goes on to talk about deception. Um, so we're going to come back and focus on that theme. But with respect to deception, an interesting thing happens on the next page. So Socrates says, let's go back and look at uh, the speeches that we had to see, you know, what was done well or poorly. And he says, uh, let's look for instances of what we call the artful and the artless in the speech of Lysias and in our own speeches. Uh, and then Socrates says, in fact, by some chance, the two speeches, I mean, he uses the dual, uh, the, the Greek dual, it refers to the pair of them. Uh, which two? He says, the two speeches do as it seems contain an example of the way in which someone who knows the truth can toy with his audience and mislead them. So he's just referred to three speeches, the one of Lysias and the two that he and Phaedrus brought. And now he says, let's look at the two. Uh, does that mean the first two, like Lysias' speech and then uh, Socrates' rewriting of that? Does it refer to the pair, namely the two he gave voice to? Uh, does it refer to all three of them as two, namely the, the ones on the first topic that were denouncing the lover and the one on the latter topic that was celebrating the lover. Uh, he doesn't say. Anyway, as he says, they contain an example of the way in which someone who knows the truth can toy with the audience and mislead them. And then he says, for my part, Phaedrus, I hold the local gods responsible for this. Uh, also, perhaps the messengers of the muses. Uh, he's referring to the cicadas. He here calls them prophets, uh, whereas earlier prophets referred to the priests and priestesses who were inspired by Apollo and Zeus. Anyway, he says, the messengers of the muses who are singing over our heads may have inspired me with this gift. Right. So where did that deception come from? Well, the local gods were responsible for this. I was inspired with this gift. Right. It seems like the two speeches he's talking about are the two he gave. Um, and indeed, uh, w what inspiration? I hold the local gods responsible for this, also perhaps the messengers of the muses. Well, at no point did he exactly say that the cicadas uh, were inspiring him. He did, before his first speech, imply that the nymphs might have been inspiring him. Uh, but, you know, when he says the local gods are responsible for this, like, that's really reminiscent of him saying, you know, I was going to cross the river, but this setting seemed to speak to me, and, and so on. Uh, so he doesn't, he doesn't make it exactly clear, but I think this remark gives you a lot of reason for asking, is he talking about his two speeches, uh, 
And if so, where in those was someone who knew the truth toying with his audience and misleading them? Um, well, you know, in, in one case, it does seem like in Socrates' first speech, that's pretty straightforward. He says there is a man who's in love and he's going to intentionally deceive the person he's in love with because he's going to pretend not to be in love. So there's a way that man is speaking to his audience and toying with them, right? manipulating that person based on knowing a truth which he conceals. Uh, but I also want to remind you of a r remark I made when we looked at that great speech, that Socrates' speech at the end gives this image of the charioteer and the horses to interpret Eros, and it seems to me uh, in doing that he reintroduces into his speech the very point of view that speech is dedicated to criticizing. So there, there's more than one candidate for where that deception might have happened, and I think it's worth asking a little bit about uh, how deception might have happened in those cases. You know, in the speech where Socrates was rewriting what Lysias has said, and indeed in what Lysias said, uh, there is, uh, according to Socrates' analysis, a deception about the very nature of Eros. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because in those speeches they talk correctly about the behavior of people in love, but they only notice the significance of that from one side. Right? So they're bringing out of that behavior the way that behavior can be compared to things uh, you might not like, and that gives them grounds for denouncing it. Right? But so that one-sided treatment of the non-lover is a way that a certain kind of deception can happen. Remember he said that persuasion works by making things seem a certain way, right? And I was saying last time that all of our language is like that. It's using our language to get things to appear to someone else in a certain way. And so what those speeches do is they talk about something real and they bring to prominence about that thing real features of it, but they bring those features out uh, in such, uh, as if they were what is to be noticed. Uh, when in fact there is more that's not being brought out. Uh, and that is then what Socrates' speech does. He talks about the same phenomena, but he says, oh, there's another way to see those things, right? And so talking about those same things, he lets them appear differently. Right? Uh, but so that's one way that deception could have happened in those speeches. What about the second case? Uh, the second case where, where I'm saying the latter part of Socrates' great speech uh, involves... A deception. Why are we deceived there? Well, there it seems to me there's a mixture of things. We're listening to Socrates and things have been set up for us to say, oh, this is important, you know, th this is where I'm going to teach you. And since you imagine Socrates to be the voice of wisdom, you hear one thing, you think, oh, yeah, that's pretty good and pretty interesting. You hear another thing, you think, oh, that's pretty good and interesting. You hear another thing and you think, okay, there's another thing. You treat them all as on par with each other. And you kind of take it for granted that those things are all part of a consistent, coherent thing. And so you turn to the last part of the text, treating it as if it is the same as the earlier parts of the text and interpret the message of those earlier parts in light of it, right? So what's happening there is a kind of treating of things as the same uh, in a way that actually conceals what I think is the important difference. But it happens because we're kind of being passive. We're allowing us to be led along by the speaker without doing the work for ourselves of thinking through the things that are being said so that we can see whether these things do or don't go together. So it seems to me the Phaedrus in its uh, discourse is putting on display some of the real sort of structures by which people become deceived. Uh, and we should then be looking at those in comparison with what Socrates actually says about deception. Uh, last time, remember, he said that, uh, or at least he asked Phaedrus, does deception happen by, by, by treating things as the same that are only slightly different? Uh, and does deception happen by making only small moves in the argument? Uh, I said at the time that I think that certainly can happen, but that's hardly uh, the only way. And these examples, it seems to me, uh, show you ways in which deception happens that's 
rather different from the specific thing that Phaedrus agreed to. And so there again, you can see that through Socrates' interaction with Phaedrus and your reading of it, you may well have been deceived again. Again, because you follow along and think, oh yeah, he said that, I guess that makes sense. He said that, I guess that made sense. And you let yourself be guided only by what he made appear to you through his speech without asking, is that the right way to construe that thing? Are there other ways that thing could appear? So his, his speech with Phaedrus allowed deception to appear only in one way, which was true, but because it was only in one way, it was presented deceptively. It seems to be important that we be thinking about those things, about the reality of the ways deceptions happen in our world and in our life. Uh, and uh, I think we can turn to a few of these uh, things that are in the dynamics of the very dialogue to, to help hold on to that. Uh, so now, with that in the background, I want to move on to a more, the more focused study of that issue of how we use words homonymously or equivocally, how it is that we can use the same word to name different things. And we'll see that there's quite a few different ways, and there's some pretty important stuff to learn from that. So the first part of the Phaedrus gives a series of speeches about Eros, we look at the same thing and look at it in one way negatively and one way positively, right? In particular, we're looking at the behavior of the lover, which from one point of view can look like hubris and undesirable. From the other point of view, can look like divine madness and the best thing. And something similar here, it seems to me, is happening with that theme of equivocation. On the one hand, we can look at how we use the same word to say different things in a way that allows for deception. But we can also see that uh, use of the same word to name things that are different as precisely the way that leads to the truth. So I want to uh, look at some of the different kinds of equivocation as they have come up in this dialogue. So the, the example that Socrates brought out was using the word horse but getting someone to think it refers to a donkey. And that can produce deception because uh, then you tell them things that truly correspond to what a horse is, namely that it's a great thing to use in battle. And that person thinks, oh, that attribute applies to this animal here, which I call a horse, but which is actually a donkey. So that's one kind of equivocation where it's basically just an error, right? Uh, the, the word is being misapplied and it leads you to make a mistake. Uh, but there's a second kind, which has come up a lot in the dialogue. And this is the equivocation that's a, a matter of analogy, or in some cases, metaphor. So he said, whereas, you know, the animal is nourished by eating, you know, food, the human soul is nourished by learning about the truth and so on, right? So nourishment there is being used to name two very different things. If you understand what we mean by organic nourishment, you can use that notion to grasp the sense in which the, the uh, higher powers of the soul are encouraged in their development by their engagement with uh, higher studies. And so on. it's like a kind of nourishment. We just saw another example. Uh, where does it fit? I'm not quite sure. He referred to the cicadas, or at least he implied they were cicadas. He said the messengers of the muses, and referred to them as prophets, uh, a word that formerly he had used to specifically refer to those religious people who were inspired by Zeus and Apollo. Uh, so there again, there's a kind of equivocation, but uh, maybe an informative one that we could play out. Those are just some of the examples of the ways in which he has been uh, relying on uh, a kind of equivocation throughout the dialogue to make some pretty important points. Now, at 263a, he introduces a further uh, important distinction. So he says here, when someone utters the word iron or silver, don't we all think of the same thing? But what happens when we say just or good? Doesn't each one of us go in a different direction? Don't we differ with one another and even with ourselves? Uh, so on the one hand, his point about iron and silver is manifestly wrong, right? We have just been seeing exactly how words like that are, are used homonymously. But the contrast he's making here is significant, right? There is a way that whereas uh, the word iron or the word silver 
refers to a recognizable and specific thing in the world, words like good or just don't name a particular thing. They name a, a value that can uh, be realized in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and so he's bringing out then the difference between what we would normally think of as a, a word that na names some specific real thing versus a word that names an ideal. And so that distinction uh, takes us back to that issue of people who can confuse you about good and bad things by the way that they speak. Because uh, an ideal is realized in different ways, and so there is no single thing you can point to where you say, that's it. Right, and this really happens if somebody wants to know what is good. Uh, you can say, there's an example of something good. Like you could say, oh, here's a good piece of music. But if they then say, oh, so every good work of music just reproduces that, well, no, that's not right. Like what made that music good was that it uh, did all the things it could do appropriately to the musical situation, right? Or if someone says that was a piece of good behavior to... I don't know, pick up that a thing that a person dropped. Somebody thinks, oh, that means it's always good to pick up something that dropped. Well, no, it's not like that. It, you have to understand what good means to see how these different specific things are realizations of it. Right? But so the ideal is always going to be realized uh, equivocally. Right? That was the point I already made before when we talked about beauty and various other things, when I referred us back to that passage from Book 5 of the Republic, where Socrates explicitly refers to the way that ideals are sort of realized materially in uh, imperfect and incomplete ways. Right? So we're recognizing then another essential kind of equivocation, right? that when you're dealing with an ideal, it's it's imperative that you realize uh, different things will all rightly be called good, even though they're very different from each other, not because they share a particular feature, but because uh, they're all defined in relationship to that thing. So we have a kind of equivocation that is uh, an error or a confusion we have a kind of equivocation that is a matter of analogy or metaphor, and we have a kind of equivocation that is a relationship of a real thing to, an I to a defining ideal. Uh, uh, now, let me get one last one. Uh, Socrates says uh, to 63c, well now, what shall we say about eros, about love? Uh, which of those things is it? So I think, again, we're going to see an essential kind of equivocation in relationship to Eros and some other things like that. Uh, but because of the conversation they've just had, Socrates has said, which of those two is it? Is it like iron and silver that name a specific kind of thing? Or is it like good and bad that name an ideal? And the feature he had identified about those things is that we agree about iron and silver, but we can disagree about good and bad. And so Phaedrus says, well, eros is obviously that second kind. We can disagree about it. Yes, it's true that we can disagree about it. But that particular bit of similarity may not be the relevant one, right? It's Does that mean eros is a word like good and bad that names a kind of defining ideal? I don't think so. I think eros is actually a thing that sits kind of between iron and silver and the ideal. Because it is it is a, an instance of, you know, a real thing, but that has different kinds of realization. Uh, and this is really brought out, especially in the symposium, where in Socrates' famous speech with Diatima, she talks about a kind of ladder of love, that you can feel erotic love for bodies, for one body, then for many bodies, then for a soul, then for the things of the soul, like knowledge and justice and so on. Uh, and so she talks about eros as a thing that is sort of progressively better realized through different specific forms. Uh, uh, with or without the symposium, I think we can, we can still talk about something similar here, that we have, through those speeches, seen that eros is a dimension of our lives that we realize in specific kinds of behavior and specific kinds of relationships, but that it is in a way aimed towards something, right? Eros 
is that within us which is responsive to the call of beauty as the doorway to the fulfillment of our highest highest human potential and so there are all kinds of things you can see people do in the world that can rightly be called erotic behavior but those kinds of behavior can be very different one from another the reason that they're all rightly called erotic behavior is because each is a better or worse way of fulfilling the that sort of drive that eros is is really about so if you were to look at those different kinds of behavior which could be on the one hand uh, two people two naked people you know frantically pushing their bodies together uh, in pursuit of uh, orgasm or you saw two different people uh, just uh, walking down the street together uh, talking enthusiastically with each other and uh, uh, living in the world just in the enjoyment of each other's company you might not think those are similar things in fact you might say oh one is sex and the other is love or you you know some other distinction but in fact they should both be understood as eros as ways that eros is appearing but you can't see that you can't see their sameness their similarity unless you grasp what eros is as that has been articulated in socrates great speech and when you understand what eros really is you can see how these two extremely dissimilar things are different kinds of realization different forms of realization of that same basic drive so seeing things in their similarity and dissimilarity really can't be separated from grasping things in analogical relationships and especially grasping those analogical relationships that are expressive of the relationship between the finite real things and the ideals that actually define and govern our world and so learning to see the truth which is really the same as turning your soul to apprehend your own deeper needs is inseparable from learning how the same words should be applied to manifestly different things right learning how to see the sameness appearing in things that are manifestly different and that is the real uh, art of speaking right the proper use of speaking therefore is to talk about things in such a way that you bring to appearance right? that you make seem the similarities between things such that they show their relationship to you know ideals and so on right and so that's then again really the difference between those different speeches at the beginning of the dialogue Lysias's speech and Socrates first speech let you see Eros only in terms of how it leads people to behave in ways that sit uncomfortably with the uh, everyday instrumental needs of daily life whereas socrates speech brought a different side of eros to appearance it took those same phenomena but showed it differently made it seem or appear differently and in particular what it brought out was how eros was the manifesting of a relationship to the ideal right and that's kind of a model then of what persuasive speaking should be speaking should be the practice by which we persuade people to see what's actually real and important in things right speaking should be giving voice to what we encounter in the world such that it seems right such that it appears to the one engaging with that speech in a way that reveals how that thing is a relationship to the ideal right and so that way of speaking is what socrates refers to at 266 b as dialectic uh, that is the ability to collect things together according to what kind of thing they are 
which will be done by recognizing that towards which they are striving. And Socrates at 266b does then distinguish between the different speeches on Eros on, on basically exactly those grounds. Uh, but now let's think about what kind of speaking that is that shows things in their relationship to the ideal, that, that brings out of things how they are the showing forth of the ideal. Right? And for that, we need to turn to a further metaphor Socrates uses in comparing a speech to an organized body. So, at 264c, Socrates says, Oh, but surely you will admit at least this much. Every speech must be put together like a living creature with a body of its own. And he goes on, It must be neither without head nor without legs, and it must have a middle and extremities that are fitting both to one another and to the whole work. So here we have, again, a metaphor. A text is going to be treated as a kind of organism. So this, this is that kind of equivocation of analogy at work. But let's think about that image. Uh, an image which is referred to again at 276a, he refers to a living, breathing discourse. And then especially uh, when he's talking about the dialectician, again, he says, you know, what we need to be able to do is collect things together according to their proper kind. And we, when we differentiate things, we need to cut them at the joints, right? That's all drawing on this metaphor. And first of all, that seems to me an extremely powerful point. It really is saying that uh, if we're going to understand things, we have to appreciate them in their integrity. We have to understand how they, on their own terms, are organized. So when you think of an animal, uh, the hand and the arm and the neck are all parts of the same animal. And you only understand them when you understand them in relationship to each other as integrated into that whole. Right? So those are the relevant ways to compare and hold together and divide to grasp what you're seeing. But, you know, you could look at a hand and notice it has fingers that are, in my case, two and a half inches long or something like that. And you could say, oh, here's something else that's two and a half inches long. Uh, the casing from the uh, bullet for a 303 rifle or something like that. You say, oh, I guess those are examples of the same kind of thing. Like, yes, you can make those comparisons. There, there may be reasons why we do that sometimes. But there we're taking a kind of external standard and using that to bring two things together. Uh, whereas in the case of the finger in relationship to the neck, there we're looking at how those things in their very being are drawn together. Right, so this image of uh, understanding things on the model of an organism and only dividing things at the joint is, to my mind, uh, an extremely important uh, critical insight into how we need to think and talk and analyze if we're going to think and talk and analyze well. So that particular lesson is extremely powerful uh, and it would be worthy of taking up deeply in its own right. But rather than go deeper into the profundity of that insight that comes from thinking about how a good discourse is like an organism, I want to look at the other side. I want to think about how they're unlike and ways in which this image is not straightforward. Why? Well, because, you know, an organism is pointedly a natural thing. It's like uh, exemplary of nature in its sort of highest development. But as I was stressing at a number of points, first when I talked about the opening scene, when they're down by the river, and then again in talking about uh, our nature as language animals. In both of those cases, I was trying to bring out how language, though it is our nature, uh, goes beyond the terms that define the natural world, right? Uh, so Socrates here then is turning to Fusus as a model for something that is uh, huperfu, supernatural or beyond nature. Uh, and you know why? Well, primarily because uh, with our language, we are creative. And this is how it's like the artificial as much as it's like the natural, right? Through language, 
we create communities, right? Through language, we articulate our insight into things and give voice to, you know, science that can be communicated to other people and so on. So the primary thing about language that goes beyond the world of the organism is that open-ended creativeness of it, right? That through our language, we can transform our world, bring into being a new form of experience and thereby transform ourselves. So that is very different from the organic life form, which is structured so as to realize and reproduce itself in its self-defined perfection. And indeed, that insufficiency of the whole world of life to give for giving us the terms to understand our human souls was brought out precisely by using life as a metaphor for the higher life of the soul, right? We use the language of nourishment, which is essential to life, as a metaphor for what happens when the soul develops. And indeed, that was made very explicit in the image of the cicadas as that came up right in the middle of the dialogue, right? Because in addition there to distinguishing again between uh, two senses of nourishment, the nourishment of life and the nourishment of, that the cicadas get, uh, he also emphasized that the world of the cicadas is precisely beyond the domain of life and the opposition of life and death because the cicadas live when they have already died as human beings. Right? So the, the dialogue as a whole has had as one of its points, you can't understand the world of language and the higher life of the mind through nature. And yet here you have nature given as the image for what you need to understand language. So as I said, the image I think is profound, but but it's very important that we don't just one-sidedly take up the way in which language can seem like nature. We also need to understand the other side of that too, if we're really gonna get the force of that point. Remember the whole point of that image was you have to cut the thing at the joints. You can't just apply things externally. So similarly, we can't just apply that image of the animal to language. And so when Socrates says, it's like a living creature, it must be neither without head nor without legs. It must have a middle and extremities that are fitting both to one another and to the whole work. We have to ask, hmm, how do, how do we make that image fit? Right? Uh, so in an organism, yes, there is a real functional division between, you know, the head, I guess, that um, orients the creature from the rest of the body that uh, moves it and the division between the right and left side and so on the distinction between the mouth that takes in food and the parts of the body that excrete waste and so on right those distinctions all make sense from the point of view of uh, a nutritive uh, locomotive being but uh, those issues don't translate very easily into thinking about a discourse uh, uh, especially, you know, that the one that he emphasizes in, in the next uh, few lines, the right and left side. Yes, Aristotle, for example, in The Progression of Animals, has this really great account of the way an animal has a, a right side and a left side that kind of mirror each other, but also oppose each other. And this explains how motion happens and so on. Uh, but, uh, but it's not obvious that that is going to be the case in... Uh, in a discourse. And indeed, as Socrates applies that metaphor, it's not entirely clear how the the first two speeches about Eros should be construed as the left side, and the Socrates' great speech should be construed as the right-hand side of a discourse about Eros. Uh, which is not to say you couldn't work that out, but it's not a straightforward application. Uh, and I think that problem is exemplified right after Socrates says this thing about head and arms and so on, he says, oh, there's this epigram for the tomb of Midas. Uh, and he says, you know, look at that. It's got four lines and you could rearrange the order of them. It doesn't matter. Like you can read those four in any way at all and the thing still works. Now, what should you conclude from that? He doesn't say. Uh, Phaedrus uh, holds that remark about the epigram of Midas 
together with a remark that Socrates made about Lysias' speech, saying that it seemed like he brought out the different uh, topics in no particularly good order. The author said just whatever came to his mind next, and there was no compelling reason why they came in the order that they did. And then when Socrates says the epigram, you know, they could read them in any order, Phaedrus says, oh, you're just making fun of our speeches. And Socrates says, okay, we won't, we'll go somewhere else then. But, but note, first, Socrates never really says what the point is about the epigram from Midas's tomb. But also think about it yourself, like, okay, you can say those four things in whatever order you want. Does that make it good or bad? There's no obvious answer to that. Indeed, I think that the real point is, that's a work of art. And so a work of art is a work of art if it does things in the way it needs to do for its own internal reasons. You know, so if the point of the organic metaphor was that you need to, you know, as he says, articulate the thing at the joints, right? You need to see how it specifies uh, what is the important way it is meaningfully organized, then you have no way of knowing in advance whether it's a good or a bad thing that you can move the pieces of the discourse in a different order, right? That is only to be understood by grasping what that work of art is presenting and in light of its needs, seeing if it has presented itself rightly. So Phaedrus lets the discourse get tripped up here precisely because he takes the organic metaphor, which is about not applying external standards to a thing and uses it as an external standard to apply to the little work of art he's just read about. And that's going to be an issue with works of art in general. The thing about a work of art or about any kind of creative discourse, like philosophical discourse, or even a conversation where you're getting to know another person, right? The, the thing about those kinds of discourse is that they're venturing into a new domain and what they do, what, what, what creativity is about, is articulating something new, something that was only brought about by that process of articulation. And that means you can't really determine whether, or more importantly, how the thing is organized rightly without getting the point that it's uh, communicating to you. So the, the parts of a discourse have to be able to do the work of getting you somewhere such that you grasp their point in a way that then allows you to see why it makes sense that they went the way that they did. But then that's a, that's a really important point to remember, right? In the context of the kind of discourse that Socrates is always involved in, right? You have to remember that's one where the goal is to get a person to change by developing insight into themselves. And so you're never going to be able to grasp the meaning of Socrates' discourse if you, if you think you can take the standards you already have from your way of thinking about the world and measuring Socrates' words by that, right? Socrates' words have to be things that lead you to develop a new way of seeing things such that the motivation for his discourse then comes to make sense. Uh, so, Socrates' discourse, in, or any kind of discourse like that, will be well organized, or if, it, if it's good, it will be, by standards only recognizable by someone who has got the point of that thing. And so, you know, they go on then to talk about uh, how an essay will be well ordered, right? It's got to have an uh, introduction, you've got to state your thesis clearly, you've got to bring out your evidence, you have to develop it in an orderly sequence of steps that gradually bring you to the point of a conclusion where you can look back and see, oh yeah, you have established that thing you were going to say, right? Uh, and that involves being clear about your terms, you know, using definitions and so on, right? That's That discussion of the different parts of good speech, you know, makes perfect sense from the point of view of trying to teach people how to write essays and so on. But what are you doing when you're writing essays, right? When you're writing essays, you're taking something that you think you already have and you're trying to lay it out in a direct order to show someone how that's so. Like if you're trying to, you know, prove someone's guilty in a law court or something like that. But that's not 
the sort of thing that's happening when you're talking to someone to try to encourage them to develop a new perspective, right? Uh, there, your discourse is oriented to getting them to see something in a certain way such that that will actually revise you know, their standards and their way of analyzing things, right? Because that will be uh, getting them to see something that is actually not able to be articulated according to the terms and standards they already possess. So that notion of, you know, introduction, thesis, statement, argument, and so on, that's a thing that makes sense. But it only makes sense from the point of view of the one who has already understood that material. So when you have truly grasped the material, it will naturally lend itself to being articulated in that orderly fashion. But that orderly form itself is not the substance of the thing. It's just the empty frame of what uh, a meaningful discourse would be. Or as Socrates then says in the various examples of the uh, doctor and the tragedian and so on uh, from 268a to 269b, is that those, those formal structures detached from the substantive recognitions and insights are just the preliminaries or the preparations or the, the external form of a scientific discourse. They're not themselves the substance of the good persuasive speech, where, where good persuasive speech is really a matter of a practical engagement with a, another soul for the purpose of trying to make things appear in a way that has the potential of offering transformative insight. So with that, we can now turn to the final section of the dialogue and look at the issues of techne and writing. Mm -hmm.